Thank you, Brad, and thank you all so much for the invitation. This is really a high privilege and a high topic. Let me pray that God would help us. You have taught us, Father, that everyone who has the Holy Spirit is a child of God. Everyone who is led by the Spirit is a son of God because we haven't received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of sonship, adoption as sons, by which we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. And so I'm praying now that in this room and across these campuses, those who are your children would feel in an unusual and precious way the witness of the Holy Spirit through this message that they are the children of God. And that those who stand outside looking in, wondering what is that, would be quickened by the Holy Spirit and drawn through Christ into your family. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some precious and powerful parallels between my adoption of my daughter Talitha 23 years ago and God's adoption of me 66 years ago. Very precious, very powerful. And there are some amazing non-parallels. I'm going to talk about one of those mainly, but let me summarize this series on the no ordinary father with the parallels. Number one, she calls me daddy. I love to be called daddy, especially by a 22 year old. (laughs) And I call God daddy. That is in my most painful, desperate, intimate moments. I need you way more than I need some Something else I need you, Abba. Two, Talitha bears my name, Talitha Ruth Piper, and I bear God's name. I'm a Christian because Christ is God. Number three, I discipline Talitha. I spanked her, not as often as I spanked my four sons, But I I did, and she remembers to this day. She reminds me that I did, and God has spanked me. In fact, I believe that under the sovereignty of God, every hardship, every trial, every loss is a spanking from my father in my life. Every one for my everlasting good. Number four, I provided for her all the way along. If she gets in a pinch today, I'll be there to provide for her. And God has provided for me everything I have ever needed because he said he would. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. And he never has failed. Not every want But every need, everything I have ever needed to do his will, honor his name, it's been there, and it will be for you. Those are the four parallels between my adoption of Talitha and God's adoption of me and you if you are in Christ. Now, what I want to talk about is one of the non-parallels, no ordinary father, because of the non-parallels as well as the parallels. He is adopting us differently than the way we adopt our children. And you could say on this one, it is infinitely different. So I'll tell you what it is. Then we'll go to the Bible to see if it's there. Because if it's not, you should not care, right? I hope that's the way you feel about everybody who stands here. I know I have a pulpit. They never have pulpits here. They just kind of walk around. (laughs) And you shouldn't care what they say at all unless they can show you in the Bible that it's God's word, okay? So just hold them to that. Wherever you are, hold them to that. 
And hold me to that now. So I'm going to tell you what the the non-parallel is. I'm going to go to the Bible and show you, I hope, that it's there. And then I'm going to try to persuade you that it's good because there are so many Christians who hear what is different between my adoption of Talitha and God's adoption of me, and they don't like it. They want it to be more human, more like the ordinary stuff that we deal with. They don't like this. So I'm, I, my main reason for coming here is to persuade you that what I'm about to say is good, because I think you're going to see it in the Bible, and some of you are not going to like what you see. And so I need the last half of the message to try to persuade you that it's, it's good. Okay, what is it? What's the non-parallel between human adoption and divine adoption that I want to unpack? And it's this. I did not adopt Talitha at eight weeks old in order that she might spend the rest of her life, let alone the rest of her eternity, making much of me. But God did adopt me and you for that. Ultimately, God is forming a family precisely for the ultimate purpose that we, the family, would make much of our Father, magnify our Father, glorify our Father, hallow our Father, extol our Father, admire our Father, treasure our Father above everything, including life itself, in case you get shot. So that's the difference. If I adopted Talitha with the ultimate aim that she would devote her life to treasuring me above everything and magnifying my name and praising me and making much of me, I would be like the devil incarnate because that's what he did in the wilderness with Jesus, right? Bow down and worship me. So if I adopted her and said, now that's why I adopted you, so that you would bow down and worship me, I would be demonic, and you would be too. So I didn't. That was not my goal. So here's the question. Why isn't God demonic? I mean, it sounds more like a, deranged egomaniac goes around trying to find kids and adopt them so that they spend the rest of their life making much of him. It's exactly what he does. That's true if it's in the Bible. So let's look at some texts. I've got three. We'll spend a little more time on the first one. It's, It's the Lord's Prayer. You all know it, and maybe you've thought about it the way I used to think about it. It's Matthew 9, 6, uh, 9 to 13. Let's read it. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, notice, our Father in heaven. Jesus is teaching us how to pray to our Father. It's amazing. The creator of the universe is our father. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So he's teaching us how to pray to our father. Not to God in general, but to God as our Father. Now, I used to read and pray the Lord's Prayer with this conception. The first three statements I felt, didn't really articulate it to myself, were acclamations or praises, not requests. And then it was followed by four requests. So here's the way I used to think. 
I praise you, Father, that your name is hallowed. I praise you that your kingdom is coming. I praise you that your will is going to be done on earth. And I have four things that I need to be a part of that. I need food every day. I need forgiveness for my sins. I need uh, freedom from temptation that would destroy me. And I need you to deliver me from the evil one so that I can be about these amazing things that I've just acclaimed. That's not right. That's why I used to feel those, those, I never even computed, what am I saying in these first three? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Those are requests. Those are petitions. They are just as much I need and I want, and, and I want you to do this in me and through me as the other four are. So that was a huge change. And when I saw that, which is really there. I mean, you can see it. That's what they are. Their requests, their petitions. Then I had to ask, okay, how do all these seven petitions relate to each other? And I'm, I'm going to suggest to you, and you just look at it and see if you think this is right, the hallowing of God's name, and I'll get to the meaning of that word in a minute, but let's hang. The hallowing of God's name is first because it's ultimate and all the others are going there. So let me repray it the way I pray it now and see if you don't think that's the way Jesus wants us to be thinking when we pray it. Father, cause, this is a petition, cause your kingdom to come. Because when everybody is gladly bowing down to your kingly authority, the central act of every human heart in that kingdom will be the hallowing of your name. Father, subdue all rebellion to your will. Bring every human will on earth into submission to your will the center of every human will then will be the hallowing of your name. Father, grant me enough food. I don't want to be rich. Guard me from riches. Grant me enough food so that I have life and breath in order to hallow your name. Father, forgive my sins because if I don't have forgiveness from you, I'm going to be swept away in condemnation, spend the rest of my life blaspheming you in hell rather than hallowing you in heaven. No, God, please forgive my sins and make me a forgiving person. Father, keep me out of destructive temptation that would ruin my life and take away every inclination I've ever felt to hallow your name. Father, guard me from the evil one who wants more than anything that I would live for my name and not yours. That's the way I think he wants us to pray. I think hallowing his name is number one because it's ultimate and the, and the goal of everything. Everything, forever, for everybody. That's the, that's the goal. So hallowed be your name. That is, cause your name to be hallowed right here first, right there next, and through us, all of Anderson County, all of South Carolina, all of America, all of the world, until Jesus comes as far as we can make it happen. Now here's the question. What does hallow mean? The word is literally sanctify. Used all over the New Testament for sanctify or make holy or regard as holy. We don't make God holy. We regard him as holy, see him as holy, sense him as holy, stand in awe of him as holy. So that's behind the word hallow. Not sure why all the modern translations keep it. Well, I do know why, because it's, it's a sake. We've prayed the Lord's prayer for in English for 500 years. And so you can't change the wording. Everybody would get all goofed up. But nobody knows what the word hallow means. We just think Halloween, and that's not helpful. But I'm 
I'm trying to make this what it is. Sanctify your name. Cause your name to be regarded as holy. That is, cause me to see it as sacred and revered and esteemed and honored and valued and cherished and treasured. I think those are words that unpack, hallow, hallow your name. And not just see it. The devil sees it. Remember the demon said to Jesus, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. So they regard him as holy. Big deal. It's so much utterly crucial that we not just regard him as sacred and holy and revered and cherished and honored and treasured, but that we feel it. Halloween happens in the heart. Halloween happens in the heart, not in the hands first. The hands may go up as the fruit of Halloween, but if the hands go up without the heart, Jesus has some nasty words to say about that. This people hallows me, honors me with their lips. Their heart is far from me. He holds his nose at that worship. So if you're lifting your hands and your heart is not hallowing, cherishing, esteeming, honoring, treasuring him above everything, those hands are hypocrites' hands. The hallowing of his name is an act of the heart. Not just a regarding of the head like the demons do, and not just the lifting of the hands like the Pharisees did, but the cherishing of his name above all things like Christians do. So here's my conclusion from the Sermon on the, uh, from the uh, Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. God's ultimate goal for us as our Father the goal for which every other blessing in your life is given is that we would revere and honor and esteem and value and treasure him, his name, above everything and everyone else. So I did not adopt Talitha that she would hallow my name. God adopted me that I would hallow his name. That's the ultimate difference. I said there were three texts. The other two, if I, if I spend that long on, I won't get to the crucial applications at the end that I want. So let's deal with two more very briefly. Number one, Matthew 5, 16. This is a few verses earlier in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good deeds, your works, good works, and give glory to your Father. Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. God has adopted you so that you would devote yourselves to good deeds to make God look good. That's what he said. You have been brought into the family of God so that you would let your light so shine that people would see your self-sacrificing, others-serving good deeds and recognize that's no ordinary family. They are living to make much of their father and I am drawn to make much of their father because good deeds are so prominent in their lives. So, Matthew 5, 16, you have a father because your father intends to be made much of by your good deeds. Number three, last text we'll look at. John 4, 23, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, you may know the story, at the well, and he says this, the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. So God the Father has sent God the Son into the world. His name is Jesus. And by his death that we sang about, And by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit after his death and resurrection, God is gathering a family out of the world. And he's doing it because he's seeking worshipers. God is seeking people to make much of him. Worship him, hallow his name, glorify him. I don't know if a text could be any clearer than that. The the aim of God in the coming into this world and sending out his spirit to proclaim his son and gather a family is because he's seeking to be worshiped. Those are my three texts. If you don't see it in those three texts, then the rest of this sermon will probably be irrelevant to you. We are adopted very differently than I adopted Talitha. We are adopted by a father who intends us to spend all our days 24-7 into eternity making much of him. Is that good? Is that good? That's my next question. Because for 45 years, I've been trying to say this in one form or another, and I know that there are many Christians who don't like it. It it shifts the center of gravity in their lives in an uncomfortable way. And I would like to persuade you not to be uncomfortable with God's God-centeredness. The father has gone to great lengths to make a family, to gather children whose ultimate end is to hallow his name, glorify his greatness, and worship his perfections. And that seems to a lot of people like he's in a deranged egomania. He's demonic. Hyper preaches a demonic father. Who would want to call him daddy? So my aim now is to persuade you Having a father like that who adopts you so that he would be made much of forever, having a father like that is the best thing that could ever happen to you. The best thing that you could even conceive happening to you. That's what I would like to persuade you of. So to do it, I'm going to to just look at one brief half of a verse in Psalm 5, 511, and and one story about Talitha that I'm going to make up about this Thursday, this coming Thursday, okay? And the text and the story I'm praying will make you have an aha moment that turns an egomaniac into the best person in the universe (laughs) and his pursuit of your making much of him forever to be the best news you've ever heard. Okay. The text is, is just a half of a verse. And if we had time, we'd look at some other verses that here it is. Those who love your name, I chose that because, like, hallow your name. Those who love your name 
may exult in you. And the huge question is, the loving of the name and the exulting in the person, how do they relate? The exulting, the, the loving, the extolling, the esteeming, the cherishing of the name and the exulting in you, the person, God. How, how do they relate to each other? And my suggestion is that the, the loving of the Father's name is expressed and experienced in the exulting in his name. Hallowing is experienced in finding happiness in God's name above all things. Admiration for the name, exaltation in the person. Admiration, that's hallowing. Exaltation, not exaltation. Exaltation is what you do in your heart when you're thrilled with something. You exult in it. And when this exulting in him happens, hallowing happens. That's the way hallowing in the heart is done. 